Awesome, thanks. I'm super excited to be here and give a primer on mass spectrometry and quantifying proteins using that technique. Um, let me make sure I got everything. Cool. So, um, like Alex said, I'm a grad student in Nikolai Slavov's lab working on single cell proteomics. But today I'm sort of going to talk more broadly about a lot of the terminology and the types of measurements we can take using mass spectrometry. Um, and I'm going to focus most of the talk on using that for certain biological molecules of interest, proteins. So, I guess we got to start the story somewhere, and um, we'll start the story sort of halfway through. I've kind of mapped out everything here, and I think you'll see why at the end. Um, we'll start the story halfway through with sort of just the problem of getting our samples into the mass spectrometer. We'll get to the sorts of measurements we can take in a second, but it's a nice starting point. So sort of with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, um, one of the problems that mass spectrometers have existed for quite a while since the 1930s or 40s, uh, maybe even earlier, and, but one of the problems of applying them to complex biological samples has been actually just simply getting our sample into the mass spectrometer. And in order for a mass spectrometer to take measurements on our biological sample, that sample has to be ionized. It has to be an ion for us to get a measurement of it. So that was one of the major hurdles. And biological molecules are complex, they're very different, so having a robust method to ionize them was actually a big hurdle. So two methods sort of emerged in the 90s for ionizing complex samples. And the first of them sort of embedded our sample into a matrix, a solid matrix, and then it ionized the sample by hitting it with a laser. This method is great, it's called MALDI, you've probably heard of it. And it has a lot of applications, but it's not quite MALDI. Uh, matrix existed laser desorption ionization. Yeah, <laughs> I got it right. Did I get it right? Good. Uh, um, the second method is a little more quantitative than that, and we're, that's what we're going to focus our talk on. Um, well, a lot of what I'm going to present today is applicable to certain parts and certain types of mass spectrometry, but I hope it sort of gives an intuition for the types of measurements that you can take broadly across a lot of different types of biological molecules. But anyways, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus in on the second technique of ionizing our molecules, and that technique is called electrospray. And what that technique does is it applies, takes our biological molecules in solution, applies a high voltage to them, and then, like the name would imply, it sprays them into the mass spec, going from solution to vacuum, where these ions can be manipulated. And for shorthand, I'm sort of just gonna draw our biological molecules of interest as squiggles, ions as a positive charge, but it can also be a negative charge. So essentially what happens is with electrospray, we're taking our ions in solution, we form droplets. As the droplets evaporate, charges in the solution are conferred onto the biological molecule of interest, and this is a robust technique for ionizing a wide range of biological molecules at once. Cool, so where we've gotten so far is we've gotten our, a wide range of biological molecules into the mass spec. Let's sort of, for practical purposes, sort of focus in on just one biological molecule. Let's focus in on a peptide, a short peptide. Now peptides are chains of amino acids abbreviated with letters from the alphabet. Each of these amino acids has slightly different physical properties and chemical structure, conferring slightly different physical properties and chemical structure on the peptides. Proteins themselves are made up of long chains of such amino acids. So what the mass spec can measure then is the mass to charge ratio. It's counterintuitive, it's called mass spectrometry, but it doesn't exactly directly measure mass, first of all. What it measures is the mass to charge ratio of our species once we've delivered them into the mass spec. There are a number of different ways this is accomplished, a dozen or so different detectors out there, but we're not gonna sort of go into that today. Just gonna focus some more on the types of measurements and what those measurements look like and what they mean. Cool. So the mass spec measures the mass to charge ratio of our species of interest. <coughs> but a lot of the measurement we'd like to do involves identifying our species of interest, and that involves knowing the mass, not just the mass to charge ratio. And I should say that this process of electrospray ionization doesn't always confer the same number of charges to the same molecule. 
It's an integer value. It can be one, two, zero, or three or four, and it's not exactly um, reproducible for any given instance. So we need to know what the charge is and what the mass is. So let's sort of uh, delve in here and take a look at what would happen if we measured maybe six million or so of this one particular peptide species, one particular biological molecule. What we're gonna show here, what does that measurement look like? So like I said, we're gonna measure the mass to charge ratio. I'm gonna plot that on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we're gonna have a unit that is proportional to the number of ions that we've been able to deliver into the mass spec. Now we're gonna take a measurement and let's see what that measurement looks like. So what's gonna happen, we're gonna have a very tight distribution because of measurement error um, around one certain m over z for this peptide. Now, I'm just gonna collapse that for the rest of the talk into a delta function for simplicity and ease of drawing, but know that it's a very tight distribution with a small amount of measurement error. Any questions so far? This is actually, it turns out, not the only thing that we measure when we look at this population of ions, this pure population of ions. What we actually turns out that we see is a number of other peaks at different m over z's. Where are these coming from? Does anyone know? Does anyone have a guess? That is true but let's say that we focused in on just one of the charges. So what we could have when we measure this is actually quite a range of masses, but let's say that we zoom in on maybe a 10 m over z space. So that's totally true, and we'll see that in a second. I'll expand this in a second, but it's actually not that what I'm drawing. Any other guesses? So it turns out that there's a natural abundance of carbon-13, <laughs> these people know, Turns out there's a natural abundance of carbon-13 in nature in all biological molecules. It's abundant in about 1.1% of all possible carbons are carbon-13. It's a stable isotope of carbon-13, of carbon, meaning that it has one mass unit more than carbon, but it's chemically identical. So it turns out that this first peak that we measured, uh-oh, turns out this first peak that we measured corresponds to all the carbon atoms in our biological molecule being carbon-12, but 1.1% of them can be carbon-13. Because there's so many carbon sites within our biological molecule, our peptide, a couple dozen, it turns out that with high probability, we're actually gonna measure at least one molecule, at least, a, we're gonna measure molecules with at least one carbon-13 in them. So this represents our pure, you know, the pure population of biological molecules, but some of them have one carbon-13 in them. And it turns out that this is well described by the binomial distribution, and we can predict it quite accurately. Kind of cool, but is it useful? What does it let us do? I said before we wanted to learn about the mass of our peptide, but we couldn't do that because that's not what we were really measuring. Well, it turns out, and you might have seen this already and be thinking about this, we can use this, the fact that we see this for almost all of our biological molecules, to figure out what the mass is. Because carbon-13 has one mass unit more, and we know that, when we see this sort of envelope of different isotopics, is, uh, isotopes of our peptide, we know that the spacing between these peaks corresponds to one Dalton in the numerator, and then the charge of our species in the denominator. So we take a measurement, we look at the spacing of these peaks, and then from the spacing of these peaks, what we can then say is maybe it's a half. Then we know that our charge state is two. That means that we can figure out the charge state of our molecule. Likewise, if we see that the spacing between here is one third, then we can infer that the charge state is three, so on and so forth. So using this natural abundance of carbon-13 
then we can basically get a handle and figure out for any biological molecule that we measure with carbon in it, what its charge state is, and therefore, we can infer what its mass is because we've measured them over Z. Cool. But is that enough for us to identify what our biological molecules are? In most cases, even though the mass spec can take exquisite measurement to high, very, very high resolution, it's often not practical, and at lower resolutions, that measurement is not enough for us to tell what exact biological molecule we got. And even, it's easiest to see with peptides, where you can have the exact same mass from a peptide where we've permuted the order of the amino acids. So these two peptides would likely give us very close measurements of M over Z. So we don't know what we've measured, even though we've gotten the mass, and we can start to take a guess at the amino acids that make up our peptide. We don't know what order it is. But luckily, there's a solution to that, that we can perform an action that we can perform, a measurement that we can perform inside the mass spec that can solve this. So what we do is we take our large population of molecules, we've seen, we've figured out what their mass and what their charge is, then we can continue to manipulate them inside the mass spec, and we can fragment them. And this fragmentation can be accomplished using a number of different techniques, but it turns out that with a lot of engineering, mass specs have been able, we've been able to tune mass specs such that we can fragment our peptides in a reprodu semi-reproducible way that produces all pairwise fragments between each amino acid. So what we've done so far is we've sort of grabbed our population of ions, measured them as a whole ion, and now we've broken them apart. We've broken them apart into a lot of these pairwise configurations. And what we'll get is a large number of fragments. I'm not gonna draw them all, but I'm gonna draw enough such that we'll be able to sequence our peptide. And it turns out that we will get fragments, ions of course, corresponding to some pairwise breakages of our peptide. And the spacing between these, a peptide can of course can have different modifications on it, and that'll shift its, this overall pattern. But it turns out that the spacing between these, again, like here, is this useful uh, metric that we can measure. And the spacing between these, once you account for the charge, corresponds to the next amino acid in our sequence. Is there some reason you get the initial fragments there, or? The whole fragment? You, you wrote the sort of initial substring, A, A, E, A, C, A, E, C, A, E, C, D. Yep. Would you also get like the other side, or is Yeah, absolutely. So different sort of fragmentation uh, methods can be tuned such that you'll get different configurations of these pairwise ions. Um, of course, we need to have them be an ion. And since charge is conserved in this process, we of course, when we fragment this, only one half is gonna get an ion, and certain sort of collision methods will put the ion on different halves. But what we've drawn, so what I've drawn Isn't here. Is there more than one extra charge to go around sometimes? Uh, oh boy. <laughs> no, just based on what you said before, that there's like, you know, different states of Z. Yes, absolutely. So. If we have a mixed population, typically what we do in the mass spectrometer, the, typically what is done in the mass spectrometer, in order to identify one peptide at a time, the mass spectrometer grabs only one charge state at a time. So typically this fragmentation pattern is only representative of one charge state. So if we remember before, uh, someone pointed out that this pattern here will actually be reproduced at half the m over z for the second charge state down at a lower quadrant of the measurement. And so those two different places can be isolated inside the mass spectrometer and then further fragmented. But there are methods where everything is fragmented at once and you try to identify all the ions as well. So sky's the limit. Um, cool, so what we have drawn here is, you know, as we pointed out, not necessarily entirely uh, physically accurate all the time, but what we can gain is enough fragments to do the sequencing of our peptide. So now what we've gotten so far, any questions on this? Any, anywhere I've lost someone? Yeah. Um, well, you also get the 
you know, or CD or other yes. things all mixed in there. So you yeah. can't just take neighboring peaks and figure it out. That's right. It's a much harder problem than I made it out to be. So this problem often involves two types of um, approaches to sequencing the peptide. The first is called de novo sequencing, where what we're going to do is sort of just what I described. We're going to look at the spacing between these peaks, and we're going to make sure those spacings correspond to you know, the 20 masses or so that we would have from amino acids. And then what we can do is infer, basically, which spacings make sense. So even though we might have mixed spacings, some of them couldn't correspond to an amino acid. And we'll look for the most likely pattern of spacings. And so that's a, it's an exercise in um, scoring and probability then. Another way that we can identify these is we can take the cross-correlation of theoretical spectra and score it against the spectra that we see here. So in that case, what we've done is we've not tried to sequence it itself, but we've taken all theoretical spectra that exist in the proteome, we've produced them, and then we simply take the cross-correlation and try to score our spectra to find the most likely peptide that it could have come from. And since that's probably still a much smaller set of strings than all the possible strings, yeah. you can do better that way by having a reference like that? Or... It certainly is an argument that is dependent on the size of the search space. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes that might not be. Yeah. And since we're going into it, a lot of the spectra that are recorded, when you do this in a sort of non-directed manner, are not identified. So there is, exists out there what is sort of called a dark proteome that is sort of an existing uh, problem in the field that there are just tons of spectra out there that haven't been assigned to a peptide um, based off of the peptides that could exist within our databases from genomics. Any other questions? Cool, so what we've gotten so far is we've gotten the ability to measure the, number, the approximate number of ions that we've delivered into the mass spec we figured out what the charge is, what the mass is. We figured out what the sequence is of our particular example, a simple peptide. But how does this sort of get at the problem at hand, which is quantifying proteins and identifying and quantifying proteins in biological samples? So this process that I described here is incredibly fast. It can occur on the order of milliseconds. The data, of course, can then be searched at your leisure. Um, but that gives us the ability to do these types of measurements very, very quickly. But how do we get from peptides to proteins? So it turns out that when we break proteins apart, occasionally we'll get a one-to-one -one correspondence between a unique sequence of amino acids and a certain protein. This is not always true, and it's probably not always true, depending on uh, all the peptides from a certain protein are certainly not unique to that given protein. But we will fairly often get a peptide sequence that is representative of a given protein. And you can do this simply by in silico digesting the proteome and seeing how many different unique uh, peptides you'll get from unique proteins. But we know that we will get from most proteins a unique peptide that will represent it. And since what we've been able to do so far is identify and quantify our peptides we're going to try to do protein measurements using peptide surrogates. So this is sort of the part of the talk where I sort of zoom in on one way it's done. This is not the only way it's done. Proteins can be quantified as whole, but that is a different problem, and it's less quantitative than using peptide surrogates, and it's also a more difficult and challenging measurement to take. Sam, feel free to interrupt me if I start. Okay. Yes? Maybe related to second picture, actually, mm -hmm. so that the spacing, if there is something is missing, to, for example, A, E, C, D, e, uh, among the A, E, C, D, maybe E is missing, yeah. so we, can we expect like A, C, D, and then more space, something like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So yeah, so then the problem gets harder. We've got this mystery spacing here. So this process of fragmentation is stochastic, and dependent on the population of molecules that you're able to analyze, that stochasticity will manifest in missing measurements. So what if we have a spacing like this? That's where the comparative advantages of the two approaches that we could take to sequencing our peptide uh, come into play, and we can start to compare how effective they are. 
But what we do know about this spacing is that maybe it corresponds to two amino acids, maybe it corresponds to three. We do know the masses of the amino acids, so we can narrow down the possibilities that it could be. And that's the best we can do. Does that answer that question? Awesome. How close are all those masses? Like, in, if you had two, are you, and given the measurement error, just sort of how well does the likelihood concentrate? typically for something like that? Like, is it, is it easier or hard based on how much noise there is versus how close the, the different masses are and how many there are? Yeah, so there are a number of different, um, it, it's dependent on how you run the mass spec, but there are a number of different resolutions. And to record this data at a higher resolution, the measurement takes longer. But you can get down to, it's really exquisite me um, accuracy with these measurements such that that distribution I first showed here will correspond to something like um, maybe one plus or minus one e to the, or 10 to the minus five m over z. So that is certainly enough for us to resolve um, peaks that are at least an integer factor, likely no more than 10, one over 10 apart. And here, our peaks are as far apart as amino acids divided by the charge state. Um, so the, the, the accuracy of the measurement uh, can certainly accomplish a lot of this. I'm not given the, probably the right number, though, for how accurate it is, but it is. Well, I mean, like if you saw a gap that was roughly two or three, could you say pretty unequivocally which two it was? Um, which, which, which like in factor? your example, you saw a gap that was maybe two, no, the next one on the right, Yep. the EC thing. If you yeah. saw that, if you saw one that was maybe two or three amino acids long, in terms of how much mass it represented. Could you look at the length you measured, the distance between the peaks, and say fairly unequivocally which two they were, or which three they were? Nikola has a good answer for this. Well, normally, the way we run the mass spectrometer, we can distinguish ions that differ with mass less than the mass of the electron. So the measurement accuracy for m over z is exceedingly high, and we can relatively easily make it even higher at um, a reasonable level. So that's usually not a problem. Our accuracy is good. So what we've done so far, any other questions? What we've done so far is sort of justified using peptides as surrogates for doing protein measurements, which is what we sort of wanted to accomplish originally. We'd like to measure lots of proteins. We'd like to identify them. We'd like to quantify them from our biological samples of interest. So I'm going to take a step back here because describing how we get from our biological samples to our peptides is actually very important in determining other types of measurements that we're going to want to take. So we have our biological samples of interest. Mine's a really crudely drawn cell. And we can extract the proteins through a number of different processes. We can then deterministically produce peptides from those proteins through enzymatic degradation. There are other techniques. And then, because this is an even more complicated process than looking at the whole proteome, we've got an incredibly complex mixture, multiple peptides coming from each protein. Um, that's just a really complicated problem. And what we want to do is make it simpler for the mass spec. I described a really simple process where we analyze just one peptide. But imagine bombarding the mass spec with a proteome's worth of peptides. So what we do then, in order to make our life simpler, is we separate out the peptides in time and we analyze them serially. So in this case, we pass them through a material. In this crude depiction, we separate them out, in my example, by their length. The smaller ones travel faster through this material. They're seen first by the mass spec. They go through this process first. They're separated out from larger peptides that go through later and go through the same process. So. That simplifies the problem for the mass spec, but it's important to note that this process doesn't give us pure peptides at any given time. We're not serially analyzing pure peptides. This process of ice, uh, these are not, this process doesn't purely isolate the peptides from one another. It's still a complex problem, but it's been simplified enormously. So, So what we talked about before was 
this measurement corresponds to the number of ions that we've gotten into our mass spec at any given time. Do you think that that's enough? Do you think that this information is enough for us to say that we've quantified a protein and that we know what its abundance is? So what we've done is we've sampled a number of ions and the measurement in here is highly representative of the number of ions that we've sampled, but it turns out that this process that I just described of taking our, uh, getting our peptides from our biological sample has a lot of different steps that affect proteins differently depending on which protein we're talking about. And therefore, that measurement of ions is not a good representation of our protein quantitation. So, so go ahead. Sorry, are, you are uh, assuming that you get um, some, at least some one peptide for each protein that uniquely identifies it. Yes. That, that much we're going to say you have? Yes. Okay. So then the question is sort of what are the biases in the process that takes you from the protein to the peptide? Exactly. And that, those biases are specific to each protein and then each peptide. So different proteins may be extracted with different efficiencies. Peptides may be lost to surface areas with different efficiencies. And therefore, by the end of this whole process, even ionization of each peptide is not independent of one another. It's dependent on all the other things that are being ionized with it at a given time. So that results in this sampling of ions not being a good representation. Well, it's not being a, a, a wholly robust representation of the number of, pep, number of proteins that we started with. So in order to control for that, we can do a controlled experiment. And this is where, all right. So one of the ways that we can do, we can control for all these nuisances, all these different inefficiencies that these peptides in C, is we can basically control for all those nuisances through every step of the process. Now what I told you before is that we have a great ability, highly accurate ability, to differentiate things based off of their mass. And these efficiencies, are based off of the chemical structure. So kind of ideally what we would have in our control experiment is different peptides that have the same chemical structure but different masses because we know we'll be able to pick them apart later on. And indeed we can actually have, we can incorporate isotopes into the whole proteome and we can even have the cell do it for us. So here's our normal cell. It's grown in, let's say it's grown in culture. And it's grown on a uh, abundance of normal amino acids with just our regular carbon-13 isotope presence. But what we can do is introduce artificial amino acids, two or three, into the growth media of our cells. And we can have the cell slowly incorporate those amino acids with isotopes for carbon and even nitrogen into its proteome such that each protein and each peptide, such that most proteins and most peptides, will have uh, integrated a large number of these synthetically added carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 isotopes into their proteome. So now what we have is a biological sample, a living sample, that has a proteome that is isotopically different, but chemically identical to the proteome that we originally started with. And the cell did it itself. So now what happens is we can mix our samples together, extract the proteins together, such that all the extraction inefficiencies are controlled for. Likewise, the production of peptides is done in tandem, and even the separation and simplification of the problem. So all the nuisances that these peptides would have experienced are now controlled for. Even ionization happens at the same time as well. So what does this measurement look like and how can we sort of tease apart our sample and what does the measurement tell us? So when we measure this, what we get is our isotopic envelope like before, but then we get another one. Space 
by the number of neutrons we've incorporated, we've been able to incorporate into our given peptide sequence. And so of course that will be divided by charge state as well. And based off of, so what I told you before is that we've gotten a exquisite measurement of the number of ions that we've been able to sample. But that number of ions is not purely representative of the number of proteins we started with. However, what we have now is we've introduced and controlled for any biases that would have made that number less representative. And what we can do is we can take the ratio between the number of ions from this envelope and the number of ions from this envelope. And then what we know is the relative number of proteins. We can use this as an estimate for the relative number of proteins that we had in our two different samples. And then the identification problem is similar as before. Any questions? So this process is great. We can do up to two or three different samples combined at once, but there are a number of different experimental paradigms. Question? Sorry, uh, I shouldn't follow the last argument. How does it let you understand, how does it let you control for the biases? So the biases are chemical specific. <laughs> now if we have our two samples that are chemically identical and we subject them to the same biases, they'll be affected in exactly the same way through each step of the process. Like, do you know something about, like, don't you have to know something about the proton Quantity, uh, protein quantities in one of your two samples for the ratios to be informative? I, I know this is a very no, no. basic question. This is a great question. Is it the ratio or the difference that you end up with? It's the ratio. So yeah, so how does that then tell you about the relative abundances of different species? It doesn't. So how do you control? We can do that. So that's a great question. So what I sort of glossed over is that these comparisons were pairwise just within the proteins. One protein, so let me put that another way. The comparisons that we were doing were within one protein species, and that's what we are limited to. So that's an awesome clarification. We can't then, we're not controlling for biases with, between different protein species because we don't necessarily know how their chemical structure is affected by the biases. But we have controlled for the same protein species in two different samples. So that's all we've accomplished. So, can't the slightly different mass between the samples affect the biases? Yeah, yeah. So it's been discovered recently that, well, not, I don't know, um, recently on the whole scientific timeline, that when you have a protein that is slightly heavier than another protein, it has a different energetic structure. And that will affect it slightly. There are artifacts introduced by doing this process. But the fact that it's slightly heavier doesn't affect its chemical properties and the chemical biases um, that have a lot to do with the, that have a lot to, the, the differences in the electronic structure are very minor um, and would really only be, I think, appreciated by enzymologists taking very, very fine measurements. But, I mean, but for example, if you're separating, your first step it, there where you separate by mass, that is gonna be effective. Separated by size. Oh, okay. Not quite by mass. So when I said size, it was sort of a, a poor proxy for uh, the hydrophobic properties, for instance. But you can do so any sort of separation that you want to do. You even could separate by mass using some techniques such as sucrose gradient sedimentation. Um, actually, no, that's size as well. So yeah, um, it was actually size of the molecule, and the size is identical. Any other questions? So one of the questions was, we want to compare across different proteins. How could we do that? Turns out we can actually do something very similar to this. And what we can do is instead of creating a biological sample that has heavier isotopes, we can create proteins or peptides synthetically and quantify them with high accuracy. And then what we can do is we can spike them into either points in this process and then control for all the nuisances. And then what we get is a ratio between a synthetic standard that we've quantified very well and an unknown biological sample. Since we've quantified the standard very well, we know how many copy numbers are, there are, and therefore how many copy numbers we started with and introduced into the process, and therefore the ratio here we can use to infer the number of copy numbers of the protein 
that we started with in the biological sample. And that way we have copy number measurements for, we can take copy number estimates for all the proteins and then compare across different proteins. This is not quite as robust as taking relative quantitation though. So let's say you wanted to compare more than two or three different samples in this manner. You'd like, you have a biological experiment where you'd like to compare a number of different experimental conditions, maybe even a time course. How can we encode more samples and control for more samples uh, in this process? So what we can do is use a different technology called isobaric labeling to encode up to 18 different samples. Now this technology works slightly differently. I'm gonna only draw two samples here, but it can be extrapolated up to 18. We extract the protein from our samples. We get our peptides. And then at this point in the measurement, we barcode our peptides with barcodes that are chemically identical and have the same overall mass. Thus, they're subjected to all the nuisance processes in the same way. So this technology is really clever in that it's allowed us to combine more than two or three samples, but how has it done that? These barcodes, and I'm gonna simplify this horribly, are attached to our peptides, and they have the same overall chemical structure, and they have the same overall mass. But what they do, what the difference is, is that, oops, I'll just draw. The difference is that they have different arrangements of carbon-13 and, carbon, and nitrogen-15 isotopes of nitrogen and carbon throughout the structure, such that their overall mass of these two units of our barcode always add up to the same mass, but the different units can contain slightly different masses within them, always balancing out to equal the same number. A oh, very simple example of this would be that we've introduced two heavier isotopes in this unit, two heavier isotopes in this unit, one heavier isotope in this unit, and then three in this unit. Now these are chemically identical, they experience all the nuisances in the same way, but they are isotopically different in these different units, but the balance out overall to the same mass. So the measurements of this look interesting. What we get is the linear superposition then of our peptides, because they have the same mass, they'll have the same m over z. And I'm denoting peptides with a certain barcode, having a certain color, hopefully that's visible. Um, and we, what we get is this linear superposition of the abundances of the different peptides from our biological samples here in our spectra. Um, but what happens then, so from this we can of course infer the charge, the mass, and start to guess at what our species is based on the overall mass, but we don't know. Then what we get again, like before, we can fragment our peptides, and again we get a linear superposition of representative fragments coming from our peptide. That's good, we can identify our peptide like before. But then we get fragments coming from the barcodes, and I'm only gonna draw two. Let's say we get this fragment, ions from this fragment and ions from this fragment, that are then representative. We can then isolate separately in the mass spec. They're not a linear superposition of one another. And we, isolate, we can isolate them separately, quantify them separately, and then what we have is a ratiometric measurement of up to 18 different, uh, we have a ratiometric of proteins coming from eight, up to 18 different samples. Cool. So what I've told you about so far are a couple different ways that 
peptides can be analyzed and that the, any biases that we see in the process of using peptides to analyze proteins can be controlled for. Now there are other techniques to do this and there are even other ways to analyze peptides and there are other ways of course to analyze proteins. But hopefully what we can gain here is some of the basic ideas of how this is accomplished using the measurement of the ions. So as sort of a concretization of this, what we can do then is, where this technology is now, is we can take measurements of the whole proteum of some biological samples in just a couple days. We can do up to 18 different biological samples and we can measure the whole proteums comparatively and relative quantitation of them in just a couple days using this technique. So any questions at this point? Yes. Regarding the eight replicate or I mean whatever kind of replicates, how can we normalize? You said the relative quantification. What would be the exact kind of the yeah measurement? I mean the kind of normalization methods for different replicates for this technology? Yes. It's a more complicated problem. Um, if you want to put me on the spot and guess at it, we could combine the ideas coming from the introduction of synthetic standards with this tagging technology such that we would have relative, a higher uh, ability to measure more replicates, but we've introduced and controlled for, or we've basically introduced a sample into that um, multiplexing of our samples that is synthetic and that we know the copy numbers of. Therefore, the ratio metric measurements could then be extrapolated back to copy numbers for each of these samples where we measured a synthetic standard as part of this plex. Does that make sense? It's not really, not really a good answer though. Um, what this technology is used for is mostly relative measurement and mostly between proteins of the same species. Yes? So the technologies you mentioned can control for biases different peptides within the same protein, and the tagging help you to control for biases across different samples. But how would you control for biases across different proteins <coughs> in the same sample? They're not. They're not. Yep. <laughs> so what we are limited to is pairwise comparative measurements, or pairwise comparisons of proteins between our biological samples. It's a really good point to realize what this measurement is encompassing so far. But the, I mean, the method you've talked about before where you spike in a known amount of protein, <laughs> that one can go cross protein. If you can accomplish that well, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So, since I've got a little time, uh, I'm going to go into, unless there's any other questions. Uh, I'm not the person to talk about high quant, I think. So if I yeah. intervene just for, I guess you need to get a microphone too, that's complicated. Do you have a hand towel? That's okay. Here, I'll just grab this All right, now first, what, what can you do with these relative measurements and what do you normalize them to? Uh, probably the simplest way to think about that is that it depends on your experiment. It is similar to the days of two color DNA microarrays. Depending on your experiment, you needed to choose a reference. And once you choose a reference, then you know how a particular messenger RNA changes its levels across arbitrary number of biological conditions that were profiled. So from that perspective, the measurement is not all that limiting. The other aspect is that we are very interested here in robust measurements that are highly accurate, have measurement error of maybe only 5, 10% or less. But if you wanted to get a rough estimate of how abundant different proteins are, you can actually use the absolute values that we measure here from these intensities to get rough estimates. Uh, and similar to the way that with RNA sequencing uh, technologies, the, uh, 
error in estimating the abundances of different genes is larger because of CG biases. Here we are going to have larger er uh, error in estimating differences between the abundances of different proteins. Uh, but it's not that it cannot be done at all. What is particularly good in this case is that we have a better option. And this is the thing that I couldn't resist to come and tell you because it also happens to be exactly the talk that they gave uh, at the precursor of MIA a few years ago. And, and that's something that I, I really, really like. Uh, we, we recently published that, can, can be used quite easily in a lot of different scenarios. It, it also can be used with uh, RNA sequencing data, actually, to compensate uh, for uh, biases. So uh, let's say that we have acquired a matrix of peptide levels. Here we have different peptides that they're measured across a number of different biological samples. They can be single cells. They can be different patients if these are bulk samples. So here we are going to have samples. And we know that here is one vector. We know that within this vector, we can compare any element to any element with exquisite precision because these are really accurate measurements. They're well controlled. And here we have another vector that has accurate measurements within itself, but then if we were to compare values between this and this vector, they will be less accurate. So that's the fundamental problem. Now, how can you deal with that thing? Well, you can, uh, and, and here we have stuck peptides from different proteins. So you can decompose this matrix as a product of other matrices. And let me, let me just frame the problem and then I'm going to tell you why it's solvable without going into, into details. So here uh, we are going to have a diagonal matrix of nuisances that is going to contain some arbitrary scalar that tells us what are all of the peptide-specific nuisances for any peptide. And then here we are going to have a design matrix that is going to contain 0 or 1 or 2, depending on the number of times that a particular peptide occurs in a protein. So uh, let's call this Z. Uh, let's call this uh, S. So S is peptides by proteins. Uh, S is peptides by proteins. That is exactly correct, yes. And here we are going to have our matrix, which is going to be proteins by samples. And then we are going to call this P. Now, the beautiful thing is that we can solve this model to a guaranteed optimality. I can actually frame why we can do that. And let me first just say why, why it's worthwhile solving it. Why it's worthwhile solving it is because if you were to do this decomposition, when you get this matrix of proteins versus samples, you can actually compare the abundances of different proteins. And you have derived this only from these very controlled, very accurate relative measurements within a peptide. So this is completely independent of the nuisances. We infer the nuisances as part of the process and throw them away because they contaminate our data. And now we have our pristine matrix. And, and this works very well. Mathematically, you can actually prove with a theorem that this is going to work, at least in the noiseless case. For the noisy case, you, you always have to evaluate it. And when we benchmarked and evaluated this, it performed beautifully. Uh, I don't want to eat more of Harrison's time to, no, to explain no. this. Uh, I'll just do it in, in a minute. And I apologize. I, I do expect that not everybody is going to follow this. Uh, I just will briefly show you the idea. Let me call this D. Um, and then I shouldn't go further there. I was told I'm going to go here. Okay, so we have D is equal to Z times S times P. These are some matrices. And, it's, and this seems like a horrendous problem. But what we can do now is Z is a diagonal matrix. It's invertible. So we can just uh, multiply by, it, by its inverse. Let, let me define lambda equals Z inverse. And then we can, uh, then we multiply with lambda on both sides and we get lambda D is equal to ST. And now I'm going to shift those on the same side of the equation. And we are going to have ST minus 
lambda d is equal to zero. And if you stare at this, you, you will notice so what. Lambda is the or the unknown. That's right. So that's important to keep in mind. So lambda is unknown and t is unknown. That's right. So Alex is very insightful here. Uh, he he he's already understood why I'm doing this, even though I didn't explain it. So what? Okay. <laughs> so what 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 is very what what is very tricky about this equation is that here we have unknowns multiplying unknowns, and to have matrix decomposition, and this looks like very hard Kaufman's problem actually. But the beautiful f thing of doing this decomposition now. If you track the knowns and unknowns, I should always do the way Alex is doing it, then you find that here you have knowns multiplying unknowns, and now you have knowns multiplying unknowns, so now the unknowns enter the equation linearly. And you can actually easily rearrange this into a matrix, and all you have to do is find the null space of this matrix. And this is a very solvable problem. We can solve it, and the result makes a lot of sense, it's very accurate. I, I do understand, uh, I did not explain this in details, it, it's really a much longer, I, I would need more time to, to go in more details, but. Algebra. You're not studying a lecture curve, you're not studying data. That's, that's right, that's algebra. right. It's, it's very efficient and it does work. So in principle, you can take these very accurate, very well controlled ratios just between heavy and light different isotopes within a particular peptide and using those you can also accurately quantify the, abundan the abundances of different proteins or different protein forms. For example, the phosphorylated and an unphosphorylated protein, what is the fractional site occupancy for a particular post-translational modification? And there was a question. Yeah. Do you have to assume something on S? Like if S is the identity that it's under? No, 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 if it's the identity, this will never work. So uh, S is just a stoichiometric matrix that tells you whether a peptide is present or not present in a particular protein form. And there is something that absolutely has to be true for S, that you need to have shared peptides. Yes, now, if you don't have shared peptides, these equations are not coupled, and then you're not in business. Yeah. And, and the really interesting twist here is that proteomics people generally hate shared peptides. They throw them away because with the simplistic approach of doing the protein quantitation, you're not quite sure what to do with them. And here, they're the crux of what makes this inference possible. So yes, that is correct. And sometimes, I, I told you that this problem is very solvable, it is, but sometimes, of course, what will happen is that this matrix here is gonna have a higher dimensional null space. It can be one, two, three, in which case it means you have a feasibility space, you don't get an exact solution. We can still solve that, and turns out in many cases you can get your confidence intervals together with your best estimate, and that's still useful. But in some cases, your feasibility space is gonna be so large that you have a lot of uncertainty, it's not useful, and you can still see that. What do you do then? Get more peptides. Go use another protease, they just with, lyse, with lyse or another enzyme generate more peptides, constrain better the problem, and then do the inference. So the, the dimension of the feasibility space probably depends on the sort of insufficiency of sharing in the design? Like when there's not enough shared. That's right, that's right. When there are not enough shared peptides. And there are ways to make sure that there are more shared peptides and how we go after them. Uh, one thing that I also think is really useful to clarify here, I, I feel quite strongly about, and since I'm talking about this and quantifying the abundance of different proteins. Now, relatively few biologists understand mass spectrometry and listening to Harrison's talk, you can kind of see why that is the case. He's done a great job of avoiding jargon. But I was trained by a geneticist, I was doing RNA analysis. When I first tried reading proteomics paper, I couldn't understand anything. It was abbreviation next to abbreviation next to abbreviation next to a jargon, and then the whole thing was just completely unfathomable. And as a consequence of that, people don't understand very well which is the reliable, robust quantitation that we can really trust and which is the thing that is kind of, that can be quantitative if somebody did the experiment very well, but oftentimes it is not. So it is very common to see papers published in Cell, and in fact they have a whole list of those, that we will speak of having used these abundances here, the absolute intensities, as measure for the absolute abundance of the protein, which to some extent it is a rough measure, 
but it's not very quantitative, and that can be quite sensitive on the chromatographic conditions and how the sample preparation was done, and this is rarely spelled out clearly. Uh, and, and that's one thing to be quite aware of, that it is not that you cannot derive any quantitative information about the ab abundances of different proteins from this kind of data. You can, actually, people do it all the time. They don't tell you that this is not very robust and not very reliable, what, what the actual error bar is. You can actually do this quite well. Uh, you just have to, to be aware that the error bar is much smaller. The measurement that here Harrison is talking, talking about comparing between two ions that are the same and differ only by their isotopic composition is one of the most exquisitely controlled measurements that we can possibly do in modern biology today. It's very accurate, so that's why we focus on this and we say this is our quantitation. It is not that this is completely unquantitative, it is just more uh, error prone, it's much less robust. I, I'm sorry about this interlude. No, that was, I think, uh, highly appropriate. I just, um, so you're saying that if you just took the raw data, you get a rough estimate of the peptide quantities. That's right. You but, can, and by rough, do you mean within 10 percent? Within order of magnitude. So you can get. So if you do it with Steve Carr here at the Broad Institute, no, you can be so. within a factor of two. Because if you get a lot of different peptides, and if you do the experiment very well, you can get within a factor of two. If you do it at most proteomics facilities, you would get it within a, a factor of 10. It, it very much depends on the facility. Also, for some proteins, you might be able to do this much better because you have better digestion, you have many more peptides, and so on. It just comes with uh, error that is much more variable and dependent on the operator of the instrument and the experimental design. Cool. Anyways, so. <laughs> I think probably, yeah, no, there's probably, there's always more to talk about, yes. um, but there's a discussion at 11, um, for, we, we can go back to some of these issues too. Harrison, that was beautiful primer, thank you so much, uh, and we will end now, thanks Harrison. <laughs>
And in some ways, it is hard if we are looking for causal associations in the human population because we cannot really do clean controlled experiments easily and there are so many factors, uh, confounders that can make it hard to do causal inference. But I would argue that doing indirect causal associations is surprisingly easy in biological systems that can be controlled, such as a cell line. You just put glucose on the cells, you measure their response, and you know that what you measured is caused by the glucose. And there are many other examples. I would also argue that this kind of causal associations are not very useful. They're relatively easy to make, but they're not useful. What is really useful is to have direct causal associations. What do we mean here by direct? I mean that if X causes Y, this cause is not being mediated by something else. Now in biology, this often will correspond to a direct physical interaction. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to measure it, but that is the direction in which I'm going. And now we may say, how do you know it's really direct? There are different degrees of directness. Now we can have some causal association that involves uh, 15 other molecules that mediate it, and that would be very indirect. And then you may have um, one that is being mediated just by one additional molecule. So there are different degrees to which it can be direct. So from that perspective, I would argue that this is one of the next big things that we should try to do uh, in our path towards understanding biological systems. And I'm gonna talk more about um, uh, approaches that we might be able to use to do that. And then of course, the ultimate thing that happens very, very rarely and that we celebrate is if from all of that we can distill some common unifying principle that we see in multiple systems. And I think that to the extent that we can do five better, we, we are in a better position of doing six, even though they're certainly not, not the same. So to begin with, I'll talk about correlating the components of biological systems to find associations and inferring indirect causal associations. And I'm gonna talk about this very much from the perspective of me growing as a scientist, starting with some of my thoughts as a graduate student. So going back to how easy it is to find causal associations. So th these are experiments that they did in the laboratory of David Botstein. He's the one who turned Eric Lander to genetics. And while he is an immensely smart geneticist with deep appreciation for computational work, he was very much an empirically oriented scientist who liked doing experiments and thought that all of his graduate students should learn that, for which I'm very thankful. Uh, and some of the experiments that I was doing was to grow cells in different uh, nutrient conditions and to measure gene expression. So in somewhat simplified framework, if we add more glucose to the cells, we can measure many hundreds of genes changing. We did the experiment many times. We know that nothing else changed in that system except for adding more glucose. And therefore we can say this, this is a causal result. It's also not very useful to say that it's causal. And to illustrate the um, difficulty in interpreting indirect causation, I'm gonna use this example which is probably a little bit closer to the work that many of you are doing. Let's say that we start with two bona fide causal associations for which we have extremely high confidence. We have identified SNP X that we are certain causes high cholesterol. And that SNP X also causes high mRNA level, high transcript level for this key enzyme that regulates cholesterol synthesis, uh, HMG CoA reductase, a very famous enzyme. So these two causal th things are certain. Now, what, what do they mean? How do we interpret those causal associations? Well, it could be that the SNP induces a transcription factor that then regulates that messenger RNA. That's a simple thing. It could be that the SNP induces a transcription factor that induces another transcription factor that then induces the gene of interest. It could be that the SNP induces a kinase that phosphorylates the transcription factor. This phosphorylation is required for the transcription factor to localize to the nucleus, and that induces the transcription. It could be a zillion other possible models, and it could be zillion times zillion models that involve branching. For example, it could be that the SNP phosphorylates the mediator complex. It's a protein that interacts with transcription factors to induce transcription. 
And then depending on which transcription factor is present in the nucleus, the SNP either represses or activates the transcription of the H HMG CoA reductase. In which case, if we have this kind of scenario, to begin with, the magnitude of the effect in the data from which in we infer the causality would be reduced because maybe in some of our samples the effect was inhibitor rather than activation. Maybe if we take another cohort of patients, uh, we do the same analysis. We have different distribution. We have higher, more people in which the L transcription factor is more abundant, so we find the opposite causal association. That all of these models are consistent with the data, and not only one at a time. It could be that it's a combination of multiple of these and many other that they didn't write. So having causation is certainly better than having association. It's a good step in the right direction. But indirect causation is really very weak in telling you what is the regulatory mechanism in a biological system, and very weak in terms of empowering, empowering you to, to create therapies, to act upon this, because what happens if you actually put a lot of effort on activating this kinase here, but you don't know that in some cases it might be activating with the transcription factor that represses the enzyme or the other one. You, you, may, you might actually end up having a therapy that harms rather than helps the disease that one is trying to, to cure. So going back to my example that has informed so much of the thinking, how do we begin to understand what, 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 what are the uh, mechanisms, the causal mechanisms that cause the induction of, of this transcription? And in contrast to the very high-tech methods that we can use to detect the transcriptional response, the methods that people have used uh, for many decades to find these interactions between all the proteins that we think are mediating the response, the protein sensing the glucose, sending a signal downstream to another protein and then to another and to another to the localization, all of this is, ba is based on a bunch of uh, Western blots buried somewhere in old cell papers or somewhere else. So we, we, our ability to identify this network here is, is much more limited. And I want to review a little bit. So what, what, were the what are some of the approaches that people have used from the high throughput data that I, I was generating and some of the approaches that I was tempted to use. And I'm really uh, following here in some ways the evolution of my, my own thinking at the time. Um, so of course one has measured lots of mRNAs across a lot of conditions. We can correlate them. We can compute any metric of similarity we want. And one of the good things about correlations is that at least you, what you see is what you get. At least people understand that these are correlations and they don't mean that they're causal. Uh, you just get a correlation network and then the meaning of the edges are just the correlations. They don't have very deep meaning. Uh, it's hard to interpret them and therefore people have tried to go one step further. So what if we try to control for um, factors, for confounders that might be inducing these correlations? Can you maybe find correlations that are just due to a particular pair of mRNA somehow being related, interacting together? And the, at the absolute simplest thing that one can do is compute partial correlations. This is what you get from regression. This is what you would get if you were to learn a multi-variable Gaussian model from the data. Um, and then one might think, at least that the, the suggestion goes, and there were great many high-profile papers published to that effect at the time when I was a graduate student, that by this mechanism one might infer the regulatory network. And when, when you infer partial correlations or do multivariable Gaussian model, of course, the model that we are assuming to control for confounders is linear. So one might want to do something nonlinear. Let's say, oh, we are going to, uh, to use a more general way to capture the similarity between different messenger RNA profiles, such as mutual information. And then we can try to weed out, to remove the indirect associations. And, and there is actually an information theoretical approach to do this semi-rigorously, semi which is known as this algorithm Arachne, developed by Andrea Califano many, many years ago. Now, let's pause for a minute here and consider what is the meaning of the regulatory edges that we are getting. 
we know, for example, that some of the most important regulators in the cell are mTOR or protein kinase A. So can you expect to find um, an interaction between MAP kinase and TOR based on having measured their, their messenger RNAs? What will be the mutual information between the messenger RNAs? Not much. And TOR is just not regulated at the level of the messenger RNA. It's all about localization. It's all about phosphorylation of the protein. So what, what, you, would, what you would normally find with this kind of associations is that messenger RNAs that are being induced by the same transcription factors are gonna have the most similar profile, perhaps. Or messenger RNAs that are degraded by the same regulators are gonna have the highest partial correlations. Uh, but then this similarity in their expression profiles don't reflect any direct causal interactions between these messenger RNAs. And it hardly can be a direct interaction given that messenger RNAs rarely interact with each other. You rarely have two mRNAs binding each other to do something. Sometimes it happens, but that's more the exception than the rule. Or let's say we want to understand P53 in cancer and how that relates to signaling mechanisms. We've measured the messenger RNA of P53 and it turns out it tells you virtually nothing about the protein because P53 is regulated almost entirely at the level of degradation. So more generally, we can put all of these caveats under this umbrella of confounders. And Alex is going to talk next week in a lot of details about how difficult it is to do causal inference in the presence of confounders and that even some hopes of, uh, that have been published recently that one might be able to do that uh, don't stand up to rigorous scrutiny that Alex has, has done. Uh, but the problem is actually much deeper in biology. So it's not only the confounders that, that you're not measuring in some sense. We are also not measuring the variables that actually direct interact. So uh, all of the variables, with it, mo many of the variables that are going to be involved in those direct interactions are latent in our data. So I cannot begin to think how we might be able to do causal inference between variables that we haven't even measured. So, at that point, I still wanted to do something sensible with my data. And even as a graduate student, I knew enough not to confuse the mRNA level of a transcription factor with its activity, uh, which would correspond to the post-translationally modified protein localized in the nucleus. So I decided to treat transcription factors and their activities entirely as latent variables. The messenger RNA that they measured that codes for a transcription factor is completely uninformative as far as I'm concerned about the activity. So that's going to be my latent variable here, regulator. And that regulator can be a more abstract quantity. That may be a group of transcription factors that have bound together form the complex, so the regulator would be the complex. With all of their post-translational modifications, we're, here we are being completely agnostic about what that is. It's just a latent variable. And then the observed data are the genes here. Uh, this is what we measure. And then my idea as a graduate student was to measure what, what are these arrows here. Can I infer from my data from this layer what are all of the arrows, what is the connectivity pattern, and what are the activities of these regulators across a bunch of different conditions? So that's what I was trained to do. And that was my moonlighting job because I was in an experimental lab and David being an immensely smart and influential geneticist, he, he, was, he was and is one of the most supportive experimental geneticists towards computational analysis and modeling. But when David needed math done early in his career, he famously recruited Eric Lander. He didn't like doing the math himself and he wasn't all that fond of that. He was fine with me doing it, but I was mostly doing this on my own because I, I was just in love with it. I, I really wanted to try to do it. And I'm saying this um, as, as the backdrop of what I'm gonna say because I think it's relevant context to understand it, both the, uh, the intuition that went behind it, a lot of it uh, really stands from a powerful intuition, and some of the naivete in what, what I developed that ultimately worked really well. So that's why I'm gonna tell you about how I modeled this. <clears throat> so this is my model. And then this model can be encoded into this matrix decomposition. 
So we, here are the measured messenger RNAs that we have put into a matrix. And we want to decompose that matrix into a matrix of the levels of the regulators across uh, the, the different conditions and some adjacency matrix, which is gonna tell us which regulator, yeah? Are you excluding any recurrent connections? Yes, that's a very simple model. It's just two layers by part eight network, yeah. And of course, doing this matrix decomposition is ill posed problem. There are infinite number of decompositions consistent with it, so we need to assume something, yeah, Alex. That's right, that's right. Uh, so doing, in general, doing such matrix decomposition is ill pose problem. Why, what do I mean by ill pose? There are just infinite number of decompositions com compatible with the equation. So we need a constraint. And I felt that the only thing that I could really comfortably assume with confidence was that this adjacency matrix is gonna be sparse. What does it mean to be sparse? It means that each regulator regulates only a subset of the genes. Maybe some regulators regulate most of the genes, but in general, uh, it is not a fully connected network. If it's a fully connected network, this is meaningless, right? It cannot be, there is no unique solution that one might identify. So we can just restating the equation here. This is our data. We decompose into uh, a product of two matrices plus some uh, noise that we cannot explain. And then we, you can, one can rigorously formulate it that we are gonna minimize the sum of square differences between the data and the model subject to the constraint here that the adjacency matrix is sparse. And this zeroth norm here, uh, if you're a mathematician, you know that zeroth norm is not exactly a norm, but basically means we are counting the number of non-zero entries in that matrix. So we want that matrix to be mostly zeros. That is what the objective function means. It means that models in which the matrix has many non-zero elements are penalized. We don't like them, we go for sparse matrices. And then what they did here was to start with the SVD decomposition of the original data matrix. And then obviously the SVD decomposition doesn't give us a desirable decomposition. We got a unique decomposition because we required the singular vectors to be perpendicular, we have no reason to believe that holds in the biological system, that's for mathematical convenience. So the idea is that now that we have the space that is spanned by the data, we're gonna look for rotations within that space to find the sparse matrix, uh, uh, the adjacency matrix, and effectively you can think of this being uh, the rotation being encoded by this matrix B. So we multiplied inside by B transpose inverse times B transpose, and B uh, is constrained to be an invertible square matrix. So uh, this uh, can essentially restate the problem. And then we are interested, what it boils down to rigorously, is just finding this matrix B that when multiplying the V matrix is gonna give us uh, the lowest uh, zeroth norm. And here comes the intuition that I'm gonna tell and I'm, uh, for this. It, I, I'm not gonna be telling you about this if it didn't work great. This actually, uh, it, many of you would know that one can enforce sparsity with the L1 regularized uh, approach, which is by far the most widely used method. This works way better than L1 regularization. Yeah. You can do that, so what Alex is saying is that, let me step back, so the zeroth norm optimization is anti-hard, it's combinatorial, it cannot be solved, but if you relax it a little bit to make it L1, then it's very tractable. And there are a lot of beautiful deep algorithms with some theoretical guarantees, in some cases you can even prove, rigorously prove that the solution of the relaxed approximated problem is identical to the solution of the constrained combinatorial problem. But in general, they, they will be somewhat different. And as it turns out, in my experience, as I was using the L1 regularization, it didn't work as well. So this works much better. And they want, uh, I'm, in part, the reason why I'm telling you is uh, my, uh, my line thought of development, in part because I think it's a good example of having a different original approach to doing something for which there is a well-established tool that uh, is based on some intuition that can benefit from being formalized and made more rigorous with more theoretical guarantees, perhaps by a colleague among one of you, 
who is more interested in that and better able than me, uh, I was at the time. So uh, what, what, what the intuition here is very simple, and this is super efficient, this is actually more efficient than doing the L1 regularization. So the idea, the idea here was we are gonna look at one column of the matrix B at a time, uh, minimizing this uh, zeroth norm here, and uh, my insight was that, well, if I have the correct vector B, and I multiply it, to, I multiply it uh, by the matrix V, that's gonna give me a vector that is mostly sparse, if my assumption is correct, that the C matrix is sparse. So if I can start with a good approximation of that vector, then I can work my way through in a very simple iterative procedure, greedy procedure as it turns out, uh, to, to better refine it and find the true vector. So I start with an approximation by uh, just removing the, LM, the row of V, so this is what I'm doing here, removing the row of V that has the largest sum of absolute values. That's argument. So in case, that's sorry? That's argument, that very first. It's argument, so what, what I'm gonna, and, yeah. That min, it's, it's not the minimum you want, it's the thing that minimizes in the task, line one. Mean. That's right, I wanna minimize the zero of norm. I wanna minimize the B vector that I want to find the B vector that minimizes the zero norm of this product. Yeah, that's the goal. Uh, so to initialize it, basically we want to find the subset. Oh, that's a great way of explaining it. Uh, if only I knew the subset, I, I, let's say I have the correct vector B, if only I knew the subset of elements of this vector here that is going to be non-zero, then I can trivially find that vector B simply as the singular vector of that subset of the matrix V that has uh, zero eigenvalues, that has uh, zero singular values. So let me, let me actually explain this on the board. This is very simple. Uh, let's see the intuition. Okay. Okay. So here I have my matrix V, and this matrix came from SVD, so that's gonna be orthonormal. And what I wanna find is I wanna multiply it by a vector, V here, so that it gives me another vector that has mostly zeros. Now, if I knew which are going to be the non-zero elements, let's say this is gonna be non-zero, non-zero, and non-zero, then I can just remove this from the matrix V, get a subset of that matrix. Now I'm gonna get, uh, I'm gonna call it just uh, V omega, which contains subset of the rows. And then the solution B is just gonna be the null space of that matrix, right? It's gonna be the singular vector that has singular value zero. It's that trivial. So it basically start with an approximation for that vector B and the way to start it is by removing the row that has the, lar the largest sum of absolute values of the elements of V. And then there's this very efficient way of doing rank one updates of the, of the uh, um, of V transpose V omega, not to compute this over and over again. I iteratively remove the elements with, with the largest values and I arrive at the solution. So how does it work in practice? Uh, here I simulated some networks in silico with known topologies and red is this approach that I told you about, RC web, and then green is using L1 regularization as part of sparse PCA and I used other packages with L1 regularization at the time. Uh, KSVD is another method of doing that. I also used uh, uh, a bunch of Bayesian approaches to doing it and across all of the experiments that I did this fairly greedy intuitive approach that I told you about, recovered the matrices with much higher accuracy across different number of observed configurations or different number of latent variables. And it's quite computationally efficient, especially with respect to M, basically doesn't care much about M. It scales very well with the number of, of variables and uh, the latent variables. So what I got out of this, and this goes to your question, uh, whether the network has uh, loops, recurrent loops, now it didn't, and that was kind of boring example. 
So I, I got a few things out of this exercise. I published this in AI stats. I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, but I certainly learned that doing mixing math and biology is a lot of fun. I also learned that these bipartite transcriptional networks are limited because you get only one layer and you get some regulators that are a little bit abstract. Maybe then you can do, a, do an experiment, go back and see if there is actually a real molecule or protein complex corresponding to one of the regulators that I discovered. And I had some intentions of doing that. But ultimately, what I really decided to do and what I'm going to talk more about now and the reason why I work in single cell proteomics is I decided we just got to count what counts, not what is easy to count. Let's try to measure the regulators. And when I say trying to measure the regulators, I don't necessarily mean just measuring um, proteins. We want to measure all of their modifications. We want to measure their post-translational modifications. We want to measure their associations with other proteins, how they exist in complexes. We want to measure metabolites, anything. Essentially, what's important, instead of trying to just get what I can easily get, try to obtain the data that can really make the problem work for me. And then maybe if we had this, we could go for doing more direct causal inference. And the idea for doing that, here presented in sort of abstract high level way, is that if we measure, just consider for a moment, that we have measured all of the relevant important molecules that participate in a signaling pathway, which includes their modifications and localizations. Let's say we have measured all of the kinases that are part of the MAP kinase pathway. Then we can take a section from that joint distribution that we have measured across lots of single cells, and we can ask whether conditioning on all of the confounders, meaning all of the other kinases that are correlated to uh, two particular kinases, I and J, whether the, their joint distribution is going to be simply the product of the marginal distributions or it's going to give you something that is less trivial. And the beauty, the beauty of that is that you don't have to know anything about the model. You don't have to assume what the functional form of interaction is. It's not linear. It's just what it is. And you don't have to make any assumptions. Now, doing this, you might say, sounds fine in theory, but this is really hard. What if you have a high dimensional joint distribution? Now, how do you really take a section? You're, you're going to be underpowered. You're not going to have enough data points. Now, that's clear to me, and that, that's encoded here in the title, enough single cells. So obviously, one needs to have lots of data points. Now, uh, is the conclusion that you biologically, or? So the conclusion if here. If this is true, then there's no relation between these two. The conclusion here is that if we condition on all of the confounders and the joint distribution of the two kinases is just the product of the two marginal distributions, then the two kinases don't interact together. There, there's no direct causality. So with this, you can essentially imagine starting with a fully connected network and then removing all of the edges for which there is no evidence for direct interaction, and then you'll be left just with direct interaction. And this is completely general. This is agnostic to having loops in the network, or you don't have to make any assumptions. It does have this very big catch. Now, how do you take a section through a high-dimensional joint distribution? I understand that's a complex thing to do. And I have some th thoughts about it. Yeah, yeah. So I have some thoughts about it. Now, one is that um, it may not have to be, by, by using clever heuristics or formulating the right question, it may not have to be the joint distributions of all kinases in the cell. It can be the joint distribution of a dozen of regulators to really strongly correlate and we have prior information that they may react together. It might be a bunch of regulators that have a lot of indirect causal associations, so then we want to zoom in and, and disentangle. So you first can try to reduce the dimensionality. The other thing that I feel quite strongly about is having this cycle of measurement and analysis because if you just start with a lot of data, it might turn out that you have density in the wrong uh, space. You have lots of lots of data points in an area that doesn't really help you to disentangle the particular regulators. And you may first want to take a look at the data and see which measurements from which condition will be most informative for being able to, to separate this. 
Now, the other thing that you may want to do is you may say, okay, so solving this in the full generality, it's looking at the section of the joint distribution as the ultimate goal, but if we cannot do that, maybe in some cases, we can do simpler things. We can say we are gonna look for monotonic direct interactions. If they're monotonic, then the covariance should be non-zero, in which case you can dramatically sim uh, reduce the amount of data that you need because when you just look for the covariance of the two kinases, condition to know the data. Now, the really important thing to emphasize here is that the conditioning, the way the confounders are being taken into account is in the fullest generality. There is no assumption of linearity that the, co that the confounders are impacting this kinase in a linear way, which I would be utterly uncomfortable with. This would almost certainly introduce incorrect associations because we know it's not nonlinear. If you're using a, a misspecified model, you're, going to, you're not going to be able to control fully for the influence of the confounders. So you're limited to being able to detect interactions that are monotonic, but you're not assuming that the confounders have a, lim have a linear impact. And then the other thing is, as I'm gonna spend a lot more time telling you, uh, we need the help of this community and the broader computational community that once we might be able to have this data, there are a lot of, a lot of clever ways that we might be able to think and take advantage of dependencies in the data, low dimensional manifolds and other things that might be able to still do the inference uh, in the context of somewhat limited data. But if you look at our ability to actually obtain the data that they so gleefully assume, so easily assumed we have, it's incredibly limited. So when it comes to measuring proteins in single cells, virtually all of the approaches that people have used rely on antibodies. And these not only have pathetically low uh, specificity, meaning that antibodies very frequently bind uh, their non-cognate proteins, non-specifically bind other proteins, but they also have very low throughput you're limited to measuring only uh, a few dozen targets uh, in, in a single cell sample. And fluorescent proteins have higher specificity, but then they require genetically engineering the cells and they certainly have even more limited uh, throughput in terms of number of proteins that we can quantify. So we were interested of developing mass spec based methods to do this quantitation so that we can get both high specificity and high throughput. Uh, being able to quantify many proteins, hence the primer that, that Harrison gave you. And I should say that most of the things that he said, not everything, but most of the things that he said and most of the things that I'm gonna say are completely generalizable also to metabolites and to modifications of proteins. So it's not just proteins, it is more generally being able to use mass spectrometry to do single cell analysis with very high specificity very high accuracy, I, see, I think the quantitative aspect of the data is very important if we are gonna really take them seriously. Try to, uh, uh, to deconvolve confounders and try to look at these things. We need to have accurate measurements. It cannot be just uh, data with huge error bars. So what, what are the, I'm gonna tell you just about the two conceptual innovations that we introduced to making single cell analysis possible. The first is incredibly simple. It is just lysing the cells in fuel water. Why is that important? Normally when we do mass spectrometry, we lyse the cells in detergents or urea, and these things are completely poisonous for the mass spec instrument, and we have to remove them. And when we remove them, we lose most of the sample, and that's okay if we start it with a million cells. I had no ideas and no courage to clean up the proteome of a single cell lysed with detergent. So we decided let's just not put it there to begin with. Let's lyse it in pure water. So the first iteration we used focused acoustic sonication, just mechanical energy. In the second iteration that really Harrison spec has uh, spearheaded in lead, we just used freeze heating and we demonstrated that this really efficiently extracts and unbiasedly extracts the proteins. Freeze heating is we isolate the single cells by microfluidics or mechanically. We freeze it at minus 80 in tiny amount of water, less than a microliter, and then we heat it to 90 degrees Celsius. It's that simple. Now, what is not clear is that this is gonna work because there is half a century of proteomics work doing things that are way harder, more involved, and dirtier. And, and actually, most of the things that we tried initially didn't work. So 
saying it in, in this way sounds a little bit too trivial, the reality is that there were a lot of modifications that went, but eventually we demonstrated that the current uh, procedure, the current protocol that Harrison has developed works beautifully. Really extracts the proteins well, very, very simple. So that was the first thing. Then the other thing has to do with the barcoding technology that Harrison told you. So he told you that we have this uh, barcodes that have exactly the same molecular weight that we can covalently attach to each peptide, to the amino groups. And because they have the same weight, a particular peptide sequence coming from different single cells is gonna appear as being the same as, as ions having identical M over Zs in M over Z space. And we can see these ions with exceedingly high resolving power in the M over Z space. And then you can isolate all of them. They have the different barcodes, fragment them, and then at the stage of the fragmentation, we can identify the sequence from the peptide fragments while do the quantitation from the barcodes. And Harrison told you just enough to know that part of what's really tricky about this process is identifying the peptide sequence because we need multiple fragment ions here. And the thing that is so simple about this strategy and so powerful is that we use some carrier cells, just a larger proteome that is similar to the single cells, to provide ions here to the peptide fragments. Now, how is that gonna work? A particular, if we are looking at a particular peptide or metabolite, it doesn't matter, uh, that metabolite is gonna follow, is gonna have the same retention time, the same ionization throughout this process as the peptides with the same sequence from the single cells. They're chemically indistinguishable. So everything's gonna be the same. It's gonna be present in this peak here. So it's gonna make this peak here higher. It's easier for us to detect it. And then when it fragments, it's gonna contribute ions to these fragments here that we use to identify the sequence. But then we can do the quantitation just specifically to the single cell because of the barcodes. Each barcode is specific for a single cell. So this really increases the sensitivity and the robustness by about two orders of magnitude. And when we, when we reduce our losses from the cleanup and get these two orders of magnitude boost, we found ourselves in the giddying position that we could actually identify the sequences of many thousands of peptides from single cells and also quantify them very accurately. Now, just to give you, we are gonna uh, uh, have a forthcoming publication maybe next week or so where we delve in more details into this, but just to give you an estimate for what are the abundances of these ions here that are used to do the single cell quantitation, we have about 100 copies on average of these ions coming per single cell per peptide or per protein to do the quantitation. So the counting noise associated with estimating the abundance of a protein in a single cell based on these reported ions is substantially lower compared to single cell RNA sequencing because instead of having just a few copies to count, we have hundreds. And, and there are ways to, to improve it, which I'm gonna get to in a due time. Now, very quickly, I wanna tell you about, and I'm running late here, um, I'll just tell you that one of the, that this problem of identifying the peptide fragments, uh, while we can do that quite well, we cannot do it perfectly. It remains an open problem. In fact, just yesterday there was a Nature Biotechnology paper describing how to do this uh, in a new way. And one, one of the things that we can do better is also use other informative features for the sequence of the peptide, such as the retention time. Here, when you do the chromatography, we can estimate that retention time. And recently, um, Albert Chen, a student in the group, was able to, to do this exceedingly well by solving some interesting computational problems, such as estimating what is the retention time of peptides from having lots of lots of runs. The reason why this is not a trivial problem is because previously people had done this using pairwise alignments which results in some problems of having errors in the independent variables. It's not clear which pairwise alignments to look at. So we use the Bayesian approach that did global alignment that improved the accuracy by an order of magnitude over decades of work of how people were doing it. And then we included those retention times in a very simple Bayesian framework to increase the confidence of identifying sequences. And that resulted in 50% increase in what we can extract from the experiment. So there's actually low hanging fruit if you can invest six months 
to get 50% increase, and he is actually a very, very talented undergraduate. That means the problem is not really in, in the realm of low marginal benefit. So does it work? Uh, we, I, I'm just gonna skip here through data. We compared estimates of protein quantitation from fluorescence and from scope MS, and we find those to agree quite well. Of course, they're limited to only a few proteins because we can quantify only a few proteins by fluorescence. So we also used estimated relative levels of proteins estimated from conventional proteomics and compared these to the levels that we can estimate from our single cell channels and we can find very, very good agreement in the quantitation. All of this is published in a preprint. You can look, at, you can look into it, so I'm gonna go quickly. It's just data. We can do this across lots of single, uh, uh, across a lot of scope. Principles and ideas are what really counts. Data are essential, but uh, one of the things I love about this forum is that um, it puts the emphasis on the ideas and the principles. So that's why I'm going faster with the data slides. You can get those from the papers. They're essential, they're important, but I would say ideas come first, data comes second. Both are essential, it's just my bias. Anyways, uh, so we can do this across lots of uh, single cells and when we try to separate monocytes versus T cells, you get this space where you can drive a track through it. Um, so the quantitation is actually quite, quite clean. And to give you an estimate of where this technology currently is in terms of throughput, cost, and so on, the number of barcodes that we have is limited per set, but because we only need an hour to analyze them, and going back to our discussion from the primer, because we can use a common reference, we can concatenate many runs together, we can analyze a few thousand single cells per month on a single instrument. The depth of quantitation is about 2,000 proteins, and if one runs it, in a shotgun mode, those are going to be biased towards the most abundant proteins, but that doesn't have to be the case. One can do targeted approaches and go after the proteins of highest interest rather than any, any one that we are interested, rather than the most abundant ones. And the measurement errors currently appear to be quite a bit better than RNA-seq, single cell RNA-seq, but what I'm really excited is that I think the technology would allow to drive them to be much, much lower. And also there is tremendous potential for increasing the, the throughput of, of this method by increasing the number of barcodes that we can use so that we can get much larger number of single cells analyzed and also larger number of, of proteins. There are some very specific ways that can give uh, orders of magnitude improvements of different aspects of the workflow. And Harrison and I outlined those in a perspective uh, last year. Uh, and those have to do with both improvements in sample preparation, improvement in the chromatography, improvements in the mass spec instruments, barcoding, and so on. Uh, they're fairly uh, uh, obvious. And in the remaining two minutes, I wanna talk about something that I think is actually quite important and a message that I would love to send to, to this community about publication standards about computational biology. Now, computational biology is still biology, and biology being biology, elite journals have disproportionately high influence. And oftentimes when they publish even purely computational papers, the framing of the problem that they're solving and the algorithms are not explained at all in the paper. The first equation appears in the online only methods, and there are very, very many examples of that. Uh, I'm gonna show you here one of those that I found recently. This comes from a Nature Biotech paper where the goal is to align those two data sets of single cell RNA sequencing. And the authors described, so one is the matrix X and this is the matrix uh, uh, Y. So the first framing of the problem of describing what the authors actually do appears in the online only method. It's not explained in the main text. And when I tried reading it, trying to understand it, what that is, it tells me that they have to multiply the X matrix by vector U transpose and the Y matrix by vector V transpose to get two indices that are correlated. So this is the, the key um, sentence here. Formally, the canonical correlation analysis finds projections of vectors U and V such that the correlation between the two indices is maximized. So what does this mean? When we multiply these matrices here by U and V, we should correlate this vector to this vector. How do we correlate them? They're not the same length. The length of this vector is equal to the number of cells in this data set. 
and the length of this vector is equal to the number of cells in this data set. They don't have to be the same. You cannot compare them. Now, if the two data sets somehow happen to have the same number of cells, so that the linear algebra uh, computation is feasible, it's still mathematically meaningless because there's no reason to expect that you should get any correlation. The cells here can be arranged in some arbitrary way. And this is the first time when uh, this equation appears in the online methods. I don't understand how anybody could have read this paper and understood the algorithm from, from this description without noticing the, the mismatch. And then when I wrote to the senior author to tell him about this uh, last year, and then he told me that he's gonna speak with the graduate student who did the work about it to check and he never got back to me. And that's actually the reason why I chose this particular paper over others. This is certainly not the only example, there are many examples. But I just felt that uh, this is something that anybody who understands elementary linear algebra can look into these equations and see that there is an issue. And that also demotivated me to do a very important thing, to tell that senior author about all the other issues in the rest of the method section, uh, the online method section, that I felt that even if I were to tell him, I would get the same email, I'm gonna talk to the graduate student and then never hear back. So there is a really deep problem of how biological papers, of how computational algorithms are being evaluated for uh, biology. And I think we should try to fix it. I don't have a complete solution. I think fixing it is incredibly hard, but I think this community here is one of the best chances that we have of trying to go in that direction, taking that path. And what can we do? Well, we can ask that at least the equations that frame the problem are in the main text. I think that if they're in the main text, there is high probability that reviewers would read them and they would notice if the framing of the problem is, is not okay. More importantly, I think it's gonna send a powerful message. Using an algorithm, if you have no idea of what that algorithm is doing, it's not okay. It's not just a black box that you feed in data, you get TSNI plot, and then you get a high profile publication. That's not science, that's something else, but not science. And of course, we, because our validation, especially in the realm of single cell analysis, is so weak, usually it's hard to do these me measurements with alternative methods, that's more of a reason to have more scrutiny on the math, not less scrutiny, because a picture is not really proving much, that one could get TSNI separation, that's a very low bar of anything. Education, I'm very passionate about this aspect. Uh, I don't do as much as I should, and I'm very happy that John and Alex are taking this banner. And I'm just gonna give you two anecdotes here. One is of a postdoc experimental fellow who was very disappointed for not getting um, a tenure track position that went to a computational person. And then he told me, I can also uh, diagonalize a matrix. You just use the YAC command in MATLAB. Now the YAC command in MATLAB takes the elements along the diagonal of the matrix. It doesn't compute the eigenvalues. So the reason why I tell you this anecdote is because there are very many people out there, including people in power, in powerful positions, who don't know that they need help. They desperately need it, but they don't. They can just use the YAC command. And I'm gonna give you another example. <laughs> the other example is when I was a graduate student at Princeton, I was teaching a quantitative methods for biologists, and a very, very accomplished senior PI was very willing to say that he doesn't have strong background in math and he wants to learn it. That, were, that was Eric Wishhaus. He has one of the most famous Nobel Prizes of the last century, and he had no problem of saying, I need help. And I think that there is a mixture out there in the community of having very influential, powerful people who have no idea how much help they need. And there are people who are willing to learn and much easier to teach, but I think we should try with both types of people. I think that's gonna take a community effort. And I also think that we need more computational biologists to be actively involved in designing the experiments, not just analyze the data set after it's collected and somebody handed it to you. Maybe there's no analysis that one can do of that. Maybe you just cannot constrain an interesting hypothesis. I think that it's very important to, to have this crosstalk and cycle of analysis and data generation and have people who really understand the analytics be involved in designing the studies to, to begin with. 
Uh, and this is a wonderful perspective from ITAI and I uh, in, in genome biology uh, to, to that effect. Um, and similarly, if, if you derive important algorithms in a paper that the senior authors don't understand, for God's sake, be a corresponding author. Because it's awful when the senior author tells you I'm gonna talk to the graduate students and then you don't hear back. So the person who understands the math should be the corresponding author. Uh, I'm gonna finish by thanking the wonderful people in my lab who made possible the work that, that I told you about. And also by advertising briefly a single cell proteomics conference that we are gonna have at the beginning of June just across the river at Northeastern and to invite as many of you as you're interested to, to attend and to learn more about the technology that we're developing. And with that, I'll be happy to take more questions.